Good evening. Welcome to Madison Public Library in Madison, Ohio's Theater of the Mind, Halloween edition. Tonight we have the first of a three-night story, William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. To hear more stories, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race. To the uttermost regions of the globe, have not the indignant winds brooded its unparalleled infamy? O oh, outcast of all outcasts most abandoned, to the earth art thou not forever dead? To its honors, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations, and a cloud, dense, dismal, and limitless, does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven? I would not, if I could, here or today, embody a record of my later years of unspeakable misery and unpardonable crime. This epoch, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation in turpitude, whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. From me, in an instant, all virtue dropped bodily as a mantle. I shrouded my nakedness in triple guilt. From comparatively trivial wickedness I passed, with the stride of a giant, into more than the enormities of an Elagabalus. What chance, what one event brought this evil thing to pass? Bear with me while I relate. Death approaches, and the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long, in passing through the dim valley, for the sympathy, I had nearly said for the pity, of my fellow men. I would fain have them believe that I have been, in some measure, the slave of circumstances beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I am about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow, what they cannot refrain from allowing, that, although temptation may have erewhile existed as great, man was never thus, at least, tempted before, certainly never thus fell, and is therefore that he has never thus suffered. Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildest of all sublunary visions? I am the descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has at all times rendered them remarkable. And, in my earliest infancy, I gave evidence of having fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years, it was more strongly developed, becoming, for many reasons, a cause of serious disquietude to my friends, and a positive injury to myself. I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices, and a prey to the most ungovernable passions. Weak-minded, and beset with constitutional infirmities akin to my own, my parents could do little to check the evil propensities which distinguished me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts resulted in complete failure on their part and, of course, in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward my voice was a household law, and at an age when few children have abandoned their leading strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will, and became, in all but name, the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large, rambling Elizabethan house in a misty-looking village of England, where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees, and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment, in fancy, I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, 
and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep it gives me perhaps as much pleasure as i can now in any manner experience to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns steeped in misery as i am misery alas only too real i shall be pardoned for seeking relief however slight and temporary in the weakness of a few rambling details these moreover utterly trivial and even ridiculous in themselves assume to my fancy adventitious importance as connected with a period and a locality when and where i recognized the first ambiguous monitions of the destiny which afterwards so fully overshadowed me let me then remember the house i have said was old and irregular the grounds were extensive and a high solid brick wall topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass encompass the whole the prison like rampart from the limit of our domain beyond it we saw but thrice a week once every saturday when attended by two ushers we were permitted to take brief walks in a body through some of the neighborhood fields and twice during sunday when we were paraded in the same formal manner to the morning and evening service in the one church of the village of this church the principal of our school was pastor with how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was i wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery as with steps solemn and slow he ascended the pulpit this reverend man with countenance so demurely benign with robes so glossy and so clerically flowing with wig so minutely powdered so rigid and so vast could this be he who of late with sour visage and in snuffy habiliments administered ferule in hand the draconian laws of the academy oh gigantic paradox too utterly monstrous for solution at an angle of the ponderous wall frowned a more ponderous gate it was riveted and studded with iron bolts and surmounted with jagged iron spikes with impressions of deep awe did it inspire it was never open save for the three periodical aggressions and ingressions already mentioned then in every creak of its mighty hinges we found a plentitude of mystery a world of matter for solemn remark or for more solemn meditation the extensive enclosure was irregular in form having many capacious recesses of these three or four of the largest constituted the playground it was level and covered with fine hard gravel i well remember it had no trees nor benches nor anything similar within it of course it was in the rear of the house in front lay a small parterre planted with box and other shrubs but through this sacred division we passed only upon rare occasions indeed such as a first advent to school or final departure thence or perhaps when a parent or friend having called for us we joyfully took our way home for the christmas or midsummer holy days but the house how quaint an old building was this to me how veritably a place of enchantment there was really no end to its windings to its incomprehensible subdivisions it was difficult at any time to say with certainty upon which of its two stories one happened to be from each room to every other there were sure to be found three or four steps either in ascent or descent then the lateral branches were innumerable inconceivable and so returning in upon themselves that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far different from those with which we pondered upon infinity during the five years of my residence here i was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality lay the little sleeping apartment assigned to myself and some eighteen or twenty other scholars the schoolroom was the largest in the house 
I could not help thinking, in the world. It was very long, narrow, and dismally low, with pointed gothic windows and a ceiling of oak. In a remote and terror-inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight or ten feet, comprising the sanctum, daring hours, of our principal, the Reverend Dr. Bransby. It was a solid structure, with massy door, sooner than open, which in the absence of the Dominic, we all would have willingly perished by the pen fort et dur. In other angles were two similar boxes, far less reverenced indeed, but still greatly matters of all. One of these was the pulpit of the classical usher, one of the English and mathematical. Interspersed about the room, crossing and recrossing in endless irregularity, were innumerable benches and desks, black, ancient, and time-worn, piled desperately with much bethumbed books, and so beseamed with initial letters, names at full length, grotesque figures, and other multiplied efforts of the knife, as to have entirely lost what little of original form might have been their portion in days long departed. A huge bucket with water stood at one extremity of the room, and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other. Encompassed by the massy walls of this venerable academy, I passed, yet not in tedium or disgust, the years of the third lustrum of my life. The teeming brain of childhood requires no external world of incident to occupy or amuse it, and the apparently dismal monotony of a school was replete with more intense excitement than my riper youth had derived from luxury, or my full manhood from crime. Yet I must believe that my first mental development had in it much of the uncommon, even much of the outer. Upon mankind at large, the events of very early existence rarely leave in mature age any definite impression. All is gray shadow, a weak and irregular remembrance, an indistinct regathering of feeble pleasures and phantasmagoric pains. With me, this is not so. In childhood, I must have felt with the energy of a man what I now find stamped upon memories in lines as vivid, as deep, and as durable as the exergues of the Carthagian metals. Yet, in fact, in the fact of the world's view, how little was there to remember. The morning's awakening, the nightly summons to bed, the connings, the recitations, the periodical half-holidays, and perambulations, the playground with its broils, its pastimes, its intrigues, these, by a mental sorcery long forgotten, were made to involve a wilderness of sensation, a world of rich incidents, a universe of varied emotion, of excitement of the most passionate and spirit-stirring. Oh, le bon temps, que c'est si acclé de faire. In truth, the ardor, the enthusiasm, and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates and by slow but natural gradations gave me an ascendancy over all not greatly older than myself, over all with a single exception. This exception was found in the person of a scholar, who, although no relation, bore the same Christian and surname as myself, a circumstance, in fact, little remarkable, for notwithstanding a noble descent. Mine was one of those everyday appellations which seem, by a prescriptive right, to have been, time out of mind, the common property of the mob. In this narrative I have therefore designated myself as William Wilson, a fictitious title not very dissimilar to the real. My namesake alone, of those who in school phraseology constituted our set, presumed to compete with me in the studies of the class, in the sports and broils of the playground, to refuse implicit belief in my assertions and submission to my will. Indeed, to interfere with my arbitrary dictation in any respect whatsoever. If there is on earth a supreme and unqualified despotism, 
it is the despotism of a master mind in boyhood over the less energetic spirits of its companions. Wilson's rebellion was to me a source of the greatest embarrassment, the more so as, in spite of the bravado with which in public I made a point of treating him and his pretensions, I secretly felt that I feared him, and could not help thinking the equality which he maintained so easily with myself a proof of his true superiority, since that to be overcome cost me a perpetual struggle. Yet this superiority, even this equality, was in truth acknowledged by no one but myself. Our associates, by some unaccountable blindness, seemed not even to suspect it. Indeed, his competition, his resistance, and especially his impertinent and dogged interference with my purposes, were not more pointed than private. He appeared to be destitute alike of the ambition which urged, and of the passionate energy of mind which enabled me to excel. In his rivalry he might have been supposed actuated solely by a whimsical desire to thwart, astonish, or mortify myself, although there were times when I could not help observing, with a feeling made up of wonder, abasement, and pique, that he mingled with his injuries, his insults, or his contradictions, a certain most inappropriate and assuredly most unwelcome affectionateness of manner. I could only conceive the singular behavior to arise from a consummate self-conceit, assuming the vulgar airs of patronage and protection. Perhaps it was this latter trait in Wilson's conduct, conjoined with our identity of name, and the mere accident of our having entered the school upon the same day, which set afloat the notion that we were brothers among the senior classes in the academy. These do not usually inquire with much strictness into the affairs of their juniors. I have before said, or should have said, that Wilson was not, in the most remote degree, connected with my family. But assuredly, if we had been brothers, we might have been twins. For after leaving Dr. Bransby's, I casually learned that my namesake was born on the 19th of January, 1813, and this is a somewhat remarkable coincidence, for the day is precisely that of my own nativity. It may seem strange that in spite of the continual anxiety occasioned me by the rivalry of Wilson and his intolerable spirit of contradiction, I could not bring myself to hate him altogether. We had, to be sure, nearly every day a quarrel in which, yielding me publicly the palm of victory, he in some manner contrived to make me feel that it was he who had deserved it. Yet a sense of pride on my part, and a veritable dignity on his own, kept us always upon what are called speaking terms. While there were many points of strong congeniality in our tempers, operating to awake me in a sentiment which our position alone perhaps, prevented me from ripening into friendship. It is difficult, indeed, to define or even describe my real feelings towards him. They formed a motley and heterogeneous admixture, some petulant animosity, which was not yet hatred, some esteem, more respect, much fear, with a world of uneasy curiosity. To the moralist, it will be unnecessary to say, in addition, that Wilson and myself were the most inseparable of companions. It was no doubt the anomalous state of affairs existing between us, which turned all my attacks upon him, and there were many, either open or covert, into the channel of banter or practical joke, giving pain while assuming the aspect of mere fun rather than into a more serious and determined hostility. But my endeavors on this head were by no means uniformly successful, even when my plans were most wittingly concocted. For my namesake had much about him, in character, of that unassuming and quiet austerity which, while enjoying the poignancy of its own jokes, has no heel of Achilles in itself, and absolutely refuses to be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one vulnerable point, and that, lying in a personal peculiarity, arising, perhaps, 
from constitutional disease would have been spared by any antagonist less at his wit's end than myself. My rival had a weakness in the focal or guttural organs, which precluded him from raising his voice at any time above a very low whisper. Of this defect I did not fall to take what poor advantage lay in my power. And this ends the first part of William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for part two of two of the story. Also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. Good night.